All right, so we're gonna do graphing. That's 11.4. So in the notes, I'm going to rearrange right here and put in all the symmetry that we just wrote down. So I'm just gonna leave some space for it. And we'll get into a uh, slope. That's a good place to start. So what do you know about slope in calculus class? So we're gonna write it as a derivative. So that'd be f prime of x. That was back when we had y as a function of x. We'd write sl slope like this. And of course that is dy over dx. So that second version will be more useful for us. All right, but we're in polar coordinates. So everything I wrote down is not applicable to polar coordinates really. So let's write down in polars. Our equation is usually going to look like r equals f of theta. Sometimes they'll look uh, slightly different. Sometimes there'll be no r in there. We saw, uh, for example, theta equals a number. That just specified a line with the slope of a line specified. So not every equation is going to have a... Uh, going to have an r and a theta in it, but most of them are. So let's look at how in the world do we get dy over dx. So what is one issue? If I want dy over dx, what what's the problem with what we're starting with? There's no y's or x's. No y's or x's, so that's a good, a serious problem. So how do we turn r's and thetas into x's and y's? So we've got a couple equations. We have our, let's start with our x equation. R cos theta. So yeah, we have x equals r cos theta. And what I'm going to do is replace r with f of theta right there. So our f theta is going to replace where r is. What derivative does it make sense to take on this last equation? I could take an x derivative, but what would be probably a little smarter? Theta, theta derivative. So let's go ahead and take a theta derivative here. So left side's easy, it's dx over d theta. Now we're gonna go to the right side. What rule do I have to use on the right side? Product rule. Product rule. So we won't need the chain rule at all here, but we're definitely gonna need the product rule. So it's gonna be f prime theta cos theta minus f theta sine theta. That's minus because it's negative sine. Theta is the derivative. All right, do the same thing for uh, find dy d theta, and I will start out with y equals r sine theta. We'll do the same substitution. r is gonna turn into f theta sine theta, so find dy d theta now. This derivative is real similar. You don't get the negative sign because derivative of sine is positive cosine, but it looks almost identical. It's just swapping sine and cosine. So any questions on our, two, our x derivative of theta or the y derivative of theta? All right, now what we're gonna do is treat these like fractions. So we're gonna manipulate dy over dx algebraically. This is also the chain rule. 
So we're going to write it as dy over d theta divided by dx over d theta. And we have a version for each of these. They're written right on the board here. So our numerator is the dy d theta, f prime theta sine theta plus f theta cos theta divided by f prime theta cos theta minus f theta sine theta. So this is super important and hard to remember, so I'm going to rewrite the equals dy dx and put it in a box. So I recommend you get this on your cheat sheet. It is definitely not easy to remember. So what, I'll write the y dot over here. If I write y, y dot, what derivative do I mean? Time theta, time. Yeah, dy over dt. So I'd recommend against it only because we're, when you write the dot, you're usually a, doing a t derivative. I, y prime's a little ambiguous here because in this case we mean the theta derivative, not the x derivative. So I would probably write dy over dt in this case. So yeah, we're not, that was back in the parametric section. So let's, let's avoid dots until uh, we know it's a t derivative. All right, so we're going to graph r equals 1 minus cos theta. Before we had turned these into rectangular coordinates and then graphed, let's instead, we just went over all the symmetry. So let's first test for symmetry. And then make a table of values using what we know about symmetry. So looking back at your symmetry tests, making what swap would preserve our equation? So changing what to negative? So I change r to negative, that'll introduce a negative sign that won't go away. What about making theta negative? Does cosine care if the input's negative? Nope, so cosine is an even function, so if I make theta negative, it's the same as cosine regular theta. So I'm going to use that right now. So we're going to swap uh, negative theta out for theta. And we get r equals 1 minus cosine of negative theta. And cosine's even. So that's just one minus cos theta. And now we have to look back at our test. We could either look at the test page and see which symmetry this is, or let's just think about swapping your angle to be negative and what symmetry you get off of that. So this is our original theta right here. Where, where would negative theta be? quadrant four, so it's basically go rotate downwards or clockwise the same amount. So that's negative theta. And what axis symmetry do we have here? X. So it'll be x-axis symmetry. All right, now that we know whatever happens above the x-axis happens below, let's think about which values, and we're going to be smart about which values to use.
So which values to use in table. So we do need to cover the whole unit circle. What half can I skip and then just figure out later? So we have x-axis symmetry. So if I skip three and four, I can use one and two and flip it over the x-axis. So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna skip three and four and then really gonna use one, oops, I'll turn that into a two. So we're gonna use one and two to skip three and four. So any questions about that? We're gonna use quadrant one and two, because especially quadrant one's always easy. I like to always go with quadrant one, and in this case, we'll use one and two, and then flip it over to three and four. Is that orange hard to read? It looks red. It looks very orange on here, like a pumpkin. Let me see. Oh, it's, that's, oh, more colors, what do we got? That's orange, that's All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, lighter. All right, so I'll use that instead. Now that looks like pink on here, but that's fine. <laughs> Table of values, all right. So we're ready to make that table. The reason we did that symmetry is so we could skip uh, some of these here. So we're gonna start with theta at zero and we're gonna go quadrant one and two. We don't need to do every value that we know about. Let's just do the zero pi over four, pi over two, three pi over four and pi. Now we need to be careful, we'll write cosine theta first, and then one minus cosine theta. What is an approximation for one over square root two? Is that 0 0.7? Okay. I don't think so. Let's get a good approximation for one over square root two. Yes. <laughs> we could just use a linear approximation, but then you probably go with one for that. It's. 0 0.707. 0 0.707. Okay, we'll just go with 0 0.7 then. All right, so 1 minus 0 0.7 is close to 0.3, and 1 plus 0 0.7 is close to 1.7. So we use those integer value or those uh, approximate decimal values when we graph. So I'm going to switch over to some graph paper. What's well, one minus point seven? Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so we need to be careful. We are graphing the first and the last column, but those are not x and y's. Remember, those are thetas and radius. So I'm going to rewrite. Usually we're usually we write them as r comma theta, but they're written kind of backwards here. It should make a lot of sense because all your angles have pi's in them, so that should be pretty clear which ones are the angles. So I'm starting with an angle of zero, radius zero. That's super easy, right at the origin. Now pi over four 
is my angle, my radius is 0.3. So what I'm going to do here is make some better graph paper. My biggest radius is 2. So what I'm going to do is basically draw a bullseye. So I'll do a radius uh, 1 circle and then a radius 2 circle so I can measure more easily. So here's my radius 1 circle. I'm using light gray or whatever color it shows up. Oh, you can't even see that. All right. Can you see that? Yeah. All right, so that would be my inner. I'll graph with that thick uh, light blue marker, which is medium blue for you. So here's my radius two circle. Problem is if you use one of these shapes, it makes the rest of your writing look so ugly. Yeah, I'll just delete it. All right, so pi over four and then point three. The reason I did this right here is so I can see how far one would be and I need to go about point three in that direction. So there's the pi over four angle, but point three is gonna be right about there. So I'm just showing where the angle is and then where that point goes. Our next point was pi over two, one. So that's easy, it's straight up, but going up one. Next, we're going pi over four, three pi over four, and we have 1.7. So here's the three pi over four direction, and we're going one, 1 1.7. Right about there. And last up, we'll go two in the pi direction. Okay, any questions about these five points on the graph? So connect them together in the order you drew them. You could technically go backwards. This is not going to be. Well, go f just go forwards with increasing theta values, just like we did increasing t values before. So now <clears throat> we've got half the graph. We're going to flip it over the x-axis. If you're good at drawing, you can just freehand draw the second part. If you're not good at drawing, what I'm going to do is draw the angles that we used and then carefully plot the points on there. So this has a special name. I think it's called a cardioid because it looks sort of like a heart. If you turn your head sideways, kind of looks like a heart. All right, that's how we are going to graph. We did this back in pre-calculus class quite a bit. Pre-calculus two, we spent probably a day and a half or two doing symmetry and graphing. So let's find some slopes here. If we look at the graph, are there going to be points that have a vertical slope? There should be. So that slope would be called undefined if we were using dy over dx notation. How could we find all points with vertical slope? I mean, I could look at the graph and it looks like there's probably three of them. So let's find all points with vertical slope. So I'm going to take the orange marker and circle the points I think have a zero slope. 
So definitely the point on the left there has one. Some, I don't know exactly where the one's on the right side, but it'll be somewhere in there. There'll be two more points that have a, a vertical slope. So now we're going to use algebra and calculus to find these vertical slopes. We have our, let's see, this is what we're going to use right here. How do we know we have a vertical slope? Dividing by zero, Dividing by zero undefined. So I want to find what is dx over d theta, and then what makes that zero. That's how we're going to look for our vertical slopes. So I'll write the full, the full thing out a second time. So we've got f prime theta sine theta plus f theta cos theta. And denominator will be f prime theta cos theta minus f theta sine theta. So we have a vertical slope when dx over d theta is equal to 0. And of course, our dx d theta is the denominator of this. That's f prime theta cos theta minus f theta sine theta. And we're setting this equal to 0. The only thing I need to know now is what is f of theta? So let's go back to where we wrote all this down. And let's see what we use for f theta. All right, f theta is what equals r. So let's go back to our problem somewhere over here. All right, easy question. What's f of theta? One minus cos theta. One minus cos theta. So a thing that equals r. So that is f of theta right there. Just rewriting the r equals f theta. All right, so f of theta is one minus cos theta. So f theta is ooh, one minus cos theta. And f prime of theta will be just positive sine theta. Derivative one is zero, negative cosine derivative is sine. All right, so plug all these in and see if you can find theta. You may need to break out some serious things from pre-calculus two class here. It may not be the easiest to solve. We'll see what you're made of. Yeah, because cosine started out negative, so its derivative is positive. Or negative, negative sine, maybe is a better way to think of it. So what's a good algebra move to make on this step? Cancel the cos theta sine theta. Oh, wait, never mind. Oh, factor out sine theta. So I could factor out sine theta. Let's go ahead and combine the cos theta sine theta to two cos theta sine thetas. And 
now we can use my favorite F word, we'll factor. We got assigned theta in, in both spots. So we are very close to finding the solution here. What algebraic property do we use next? Not inverse. So what you're looking at is A times B equals zero. We don't divide by sine, we're using the zero product property, either the first term, the first factor, or the second factor, zero, or both. So this is a zero product property we're using now. Usually, you see the zero product property written with x's, like x minus 1 times x plus 2 equals 0, and then you say the first factor is 0 or the second factor is 0. So that's where you've seen zero product property again and again and again. So we're just using it here on these factors. So either sine theta equals 0 or 2 cos theta minus 1 equals 0. All right, now you can find the theta values that make these true. The first one should be somewhat obvious. It's already sine theta equals zero. Just tell me what thetas make that zero. The second one, you have to do a tiny bit of algebra. I think your question is like way, way up here. Then when we multiply the sine over, we get the, look, we multiply one by sine theta, so we get the sine theta. Oh, oh, you multiply it. Okay, I see. You get that. It all comes from the derivative of this first one, or the derivative of the second one, depending on which, which one you're pointing to. I don't know if this. It looks fancy, but then watch when I actually write on it. It makes all the rest of my lines look so bad. <laughs> Although, if I really cared and wanted to be crazy. Oh, we can only write on that side? What type of ruler is this? <laughs> but that's not even, now that looks really bad too. <laughs> All right, so sine theta needs to be zero. That's the y coordinate. So there are two places on the unit circle where that happens right there. So theta equals there's not just two spots, but that's 0 pi, 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, and also negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 pi. So we'll write it as n 
pi for any integer n. So any integer multiple of pi will be right there. All right, that takes care of the sine. Now we're going over for the cosine. So add one, divide by two. So cos theta equals positive one half. So draw another unit circle. One half is the x coordinate. That's what cosine uses. So there are two x coordinates whose value is positive one half. They're right there. And all we need to do is figure out what angle we're looking at on these x coordinates. So this will be pi over 3 and negative pi over 3. And I can add 2 pi n to each of these. So theta equals negative pi over 3 plus 2 pi n. Or negative pi over 3 plus 2 pi n. And that's for any n and z. Oh, as I was saying, one of them is positive and the other one's negative. All right, excellent. All right, so these are the points where we will have a vertical slope, or the x uh, dx over d theta will be zero. So now we'll go back to our original graph and actually fill in more precisely which points those are. So it's pretty clear on the left that we had that, that point right there. So that should be pretty obvious. Now over on the right, <clears throat> how do I know it's not this? Oh no. How do I know it's not this point I circled right here? I almost pi over 4, so pi over 3 is a little further up. I didn't graph pi over 3, but it's going to be somewhere between the, the point I did circle and the next one. So we'll just say right <laughs> there. I think I started out in the right spot. So right about there, and then right about there. That'll be my vertical points of the vertical slope right there. I could ask you for other slope values, for example, horizontal slope. How many points do you think will have horizontal slope? I'll use green for that. All right, how about a lower bound? Is there more than one? Yes. So there should be two. Now, is there a third? Maybe? Think about this one right here. So they're going to be coming together like that if we zoomed in really far. So you'll actually get a third point, which should be the origin right there. All right, how would I find that? It's a frog. Okay. <laughs> So I would make the numerator zero instead of the denominator. That'd give me a flat slope. And there's other slope values, but I don't want to just start guessing them because chances are I pro it'll probably be really hard algebra to find some of those other values. But you can get any uh, slope value, but the algebra may be a bit more difficult than what we just did. All right, so that is all there is to finding slopes of trig function or slopes of polar coordinates. So we're going to move on to areas and then we'll go to lengths in polar coordinates. And that's the next section.
we're going to use the same f function as before, where r is related to theta with this f of theta function. So the same way we, we the same form we looked at earlier. So if your equation does not start with r equals, you're just going to solve for r. And that's how you're going to get your r equals form. So now what we're going to do is fill in the area. So do not write what I'm about to write here. I'll add in a red pen. Oh, what color is going to be red? That looks pretty red right there. All right, what would be really misleading and incorrect about talking about areas like this? It's not polar. That's not polar. There are no rectangles in polar coordinates. Well, there actually is a rectangle, but it doesn't have straight sides. <laughs> we'll, we'll draw a polar rectangle soon. Actually, we did draw polar rectangles already. Here's two polar rectangles. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. So your thetas are between two values, and then your radius is between two values. <laughs> Somewhere around. I don't think I wrote down the. Uh, well, while we're talking about it, let's write down the equations for these. So we'll label the upper one. Let's see, we use pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. And then, I think we use radius 1 and 2, I'm pretty sure. I probably, yep, kept it easy, 1 and 2. So I'll call that R1 for polar rectangle 1 at the top. So we normally go radius first, and then angle second. So our radius is going to be between 1 and 2. So I'm writing that closed interval from 1 to 2. That's our radius. And then our theta will be the closed interval from pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4. So it's a little bit strange, but your first interval is your radius, and your second interval is your theta. These work a lot like windshield wipers, where your small radius is the how far your start of your windshield wiper is away from where, where it turns, and then your big radius is the end of your windshield wiper to where your windshield wiper turns. So that's really what you're looking at here. All right, write down R2. Uh, in its rectangle radius times theta. So don't use negative radius because then things start to go backwards and weird and stuff like that. So don't use the second version right there. Keep it simple. Positive radius and make sure that you always have your small number, comma, big number. Don't go big, comma, small. All right, so those are two polar rectangles. What we're about to do is get the area of these. We're going to jump back into our section, 11.5. So when we think about the input, the input's going to be theta. So when we subdivide this, it's going to subdivide you know, like a bicycle spoke like bicycle spokes on a wheel. So it's going to be subdivided by angles. So I'm not going to draw every angle, I'll just draw a few of them right here. And we'll always start from the origin. You just kind of choose a point. Uh, you always have to start your angles from the origin. Kind of
like a harp, yeah. More like a wave. Proper ocean wave. Not just swell like a sine wave. That's true. This is what they call a very heavy wave. There's too much water above your head. It's very dangerous. Yeah. All right. So here is the different theta values. Let's call one of them. So we'll give them some labels. I'll call this one. Or should I? I'll label. It's going to be obnoxious if I label over there. I'll label it here at the end. So we'll go theta k, theta k plus one, and then that last one at the top that I wrote will be theta k plus two. So these are just three different subdivisions right here. I'm going to consider uh, being between theta k and theta k plus one. So these should all be subdivided the same amount. So delta theta will be the angle in between each of these. So there should be subdivided evenly. Delta theta equals the angle increment. So I can't fit the delta theta in, but every one of these little angles right here is delta uh, theta. All right, now we're going to have a rectangle. So unfortunately, just like before when we did curves, I can't make a perfect rectangle. So I'll start. So we're going to start here at the origin. That's one end of the rectangle. And I can either use that point or that point. And it turns out it doesn't matter which of the points I use because at some point we're going to take the limit and all these will become tiny. So I'm just going to use the bottom point right there. Now when you cap this off, do not go straight. You're making a polar rectangle, so it's going to look like that. So it's pizza crust is what you're drawing. So if you ordered one pizza and you realize you have 20 guests, you cut the tiniest pieces of pizza. So that's what we're doing. A really tiny sliver of pizza. All right, we need the area of this piece. So we'll go with a K is the area of the cave piece. I'll go with slice. That's more descriptive. Okay, how do we get the area of a slice? We don't need an integral for this. It has a really nice shape. So let's start out. What's the area of the full circle, the pizza that this came from? Um, pi, r pi r squared. So that's the area of the pizza that this piece came from. But I need to scale it down to the amount we have. So we're going to go what portion of a full rotation we have. What portion do we have of a full rotation? Delta that's our delta theta right there. So that's the amount. Uh, we're, of course, measuring in radians. So it's pi r squared delta theta divided by a full rotation will be 2 pi. So our pi's cancel out. We have 1 half r squared delta theta is a k. And this is a good place to stop. 
So basically we're going to be integrating this and then computing some integrals. That's what's coming next.